In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The epistle is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Catholics in Rome, chapter 12. Brethren, be not wise in your own conceits. To no man render evil for evil, but provide good things, not only in the sight of God, but also in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as far as in you lies, be at peace with all men. Do not avenge yourselves, beloved, but give place to the wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if thy enemy is hungry, give him food. And if he is thirsty, give him drink. For by sowing thou wilt heap coals of fire upon his head. Be not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The Holy Gospel. At that time, when Jesus had come down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came up and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And stretching forth his hand, Jesus touched him, saying, I will be thou made clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See, thou tell no one, but go show thyself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a witness to them. Now when he had entered Capernaum, there came to him a centurion who entreated him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying sick in the house, paralyzed, and is grievously afflicted. Jesus said to him, I will come and cure him. But in answer the centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but only say the word in my servant, will be healed. For I too am a man subject to authority, and have soldiers subject to me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following him, Amen, I say to you, I have not found such great faith in Israel. And I tell you that many will come from the east and from the west, and will feast with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom will be put forth into the darkness outside. There will be weeping and the gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go thy way, as thou hast believed, so be it done to thee. And the servant was healed in that hour. Thus are the words of the Sacred In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. First off, you all know that uh, Pope Francis was in the Philippines and uh, made a, another scandalous statement mocking the large Catholic families and saying something equivalent to uh, there's no need to multiply like rabbits which is a coming from the mouth of a priest would already be shocking, but from the Pope. Certainly, Archbishop Lefebvre, he said it under the reign of Pope John Paul II. Rome has lost the faith. Rome has lost the faith. It is certain. It is certain. It is certain. He em emphasizes it over and over again. Rome has lost the faith. And this Pope just confirms the loss of the faith. So this attack on the large family. We were in the Philippines. Uh, we flew out the day before the Pope arrived last week. And uh, I can say on my sh very short visit, uh, but there's, there's, they, they do have a lot of children. It's a beautiful thing. And the families have many, many children. Uh, maybe not all out of wedlock, okay, but they have them at least. They take, the, and the, the families take the children God sends. Let me read to you a quote. I won't tell you what year this is, but uh, just listen. This is written by a priest. 
he's talking here about obviously artificial birth control is condemned and but many Catholics think that natural family planning is a Catholic ex, is an, a Catholic excuse to uh, limit children and, and this is what he's talking about this priest the natural family planning mentality has a tear-jerker argument but God wants people to use prudence in bringing children into the world. Neither God nor his church demands people have as many kids as possible. People should use discretion, be decent enough to plan their family. Isn't it far better that a few kids be well-fed, well-clothed, well-educated, than a large family endure poverty? So this is the common objection. It sounds good, doesn't it, says this priest. People advancing this line are often quite righteous about it. With pharisaical smugness, they feel sorry for those imprudent pregnancies of poor parents. But I'm, I'm sick of them, he says. They're the kind who probably pitied Mary of Nazareth, carrying a baby God had sent, but for whom St. Joseph and Mary couldn't find a home. Talk about a housing storage and tough landlords. They're the kind who pitied my own mother when she carried me, her twelfth child. Sweet chance, I and many other poor kid like me would have to be priests if the natural family planning mentality prevailed. And, that, and what would the bleeding hearts of another day have done about Nancy Hanks carrying the baby who became Abraham Lincoln. There would have been no St. Bernadette of Lourdes coming from a jail flat, or St. Teresa of Lisieux from sickly parents, and a mother who lost three babies in a row. And many certainly, and most certainly, not a St. Catherine of Siena, a 23rd child out of 24 if the prudent planners had their way. What all these extollers of prudence forget is God's will is the end of man, is the purpose of man. The essence of sanctity is doing God's will within our state of life. It's his job to run the world. It's ours to do his will. Prudence is a cardinal virtue, highly praiseworthy indeed, but faith, hope, and charity are supernatural virtues far more praiseworthy. And the greatest of these is the charity. What nobler way to practice charity than to cooperate with God in passing on new life when God wants it to be born, not when humans think it should. Let only God play God. And he says elsewhere, these these uh, plan parenthood. They plan families out of existence, he says. And with all their... Uh, every So what we Catholics who are... We must keep the faith. And when Pope Pius XII spoke about natural family planning, he's talking about as a tolerated evil in a very emergency situation. And... Uh, this priest writes, he is writing this, believe it or not, you would think it would be written within the last 10 years. This was written in 1948, Father Hugh Calkins. And already the liberal Catholics, the liberal priests, were pushing this idea as Catholic birth control already in the 40s. And uh, <clears throat> one, of our, one of our priests that preached to us as deacons many years ago, back in 1991, this old priest, he told us that when he gave a sermon one time in his parish church in the 1940s, he gave a sermon condemning birth control, an NFP. And uh, the following week, there had been many phone calls that week at the rectory. The following week, this priest uh, was going to the pulpit to preach, and the, the pastor 
came out and he said to the priest, I'll preach this sermon. So the, the priest offering the Mass, Father Horvath was his name, he went to sit down in the priest's sedilla. The pastor got up in, in, the, in the pulpit and he pointed to Father Horvath and said, This priest will not preach from this pulpit again. And that tells you the whole liberal mentality, even in the 40s and 50s. And when Bishop Williamson uh, often speaks about the 50s-ism, this is what he means. It's all the externals of tradition, all the trappings of tradition, but liberal minds. And this is what happened after Vatican II, the triumph of this revolution in the church. And this is now affecting the, the, the ex-SSPX, the ex-Society of Pius X. Because with Bishop Follet and the Bishop Galaretta and Bishop Tissier, who are not opposing this new direction of going with modernist Rome and signing on to the doctrinal declaration, the doctrinal declaration boils down to this, and I'm going to put it as a question to you. Do you accept 95% of Vatican II? Do you accept the new code of canon law, which teaches a new doctrine on marriage and is loaded with heresies? Do you accept the new mass as legitimate and legitimately promulgated? Do you accept the new oath of fidelity which Archbishop Lefebvre condemned in 1989 because it accepts the council. And he said about St. Peter, slowly, slowly they imbibe the council and they become like uh, empty shells. They have the cassocks, they have the Latin mass, but they don't any longer fight for the faith. And they end up losing it by going with the conciliar church. And that's what's happening now. And this is the 50s-ism that, uh, that is a real problem. And Archbishop Lefebvre spoke about this also. He said the next step of the revolution, foreseen in the future. So he died in 1991, and he saw in the future the next steps of the revolution will be the, the modernists getting the Society of Pius X to accept even just a little bit of Vatican II, of the new Mass as legitimate, of the new Code, the new Catechism, and so forth, just to accept, just concede a little bit and keep the exterior of tradition. And slowly it gets gutted out. So uh, you, it's like an eggshell that has no more egg in it. No yolk, no egg, it's just an empty shell. It looks the same. From far it looks heavy, it looks like a normal egg but it's empty. And this is what is happening. And this is why uh, for Pope Francis to attack the Catholic family the, the way he did, he, he's digging himself a deep hole in hell, this poor Pope. And he's taking thousands and thousands of souls with him. So pray for his conversion and pray that he will consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart as Our Lady asked. Such a simple solution. So do pray and keep the daily rosary. Let me just uh, bring out from this gospel these great words of our Lord. And I say to you that many shall come from the east and the west. That is the Gentiles. That is the non-Jews. Because when Christ died on the cross, the curtain in the temple, it was as if God took a piece of paper, the curtain, and just ripped it in half. And this curtain in the temple uh, was not like these these uh, what do you call these things uh, window covers uh, it was 60 feet high in the temple 60 feet high with thick material did you ever try to cut with scissors uh, material even this thick it's very hard so from top to bottom the curtain in the temple was ripped to show the death the finishing, the fulfillment would be the best word. The fulfillment of the Jewish religion. Because everything in the Jewish religion foretold by Adam, Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and all the Old Testament prophets, 
everything pointed to our Lord Jesus Christ. He fulfills everything. And all the Old Testament sacrifices, the butchering of the lamb, the sprinkling of the blood, the burning of the victim, and including the burning of the entrails. And the, the sometimes in some sacrifices, the priest would eat the meat of the burnt victim. All this pointed to Christ. And even the Holy Family, the child Jesus, at the age of, of a little Mirabel here, he would go every year with Jesus and Mary to, the, to Jerusalem. And our Lord watched, and the Virgin Mary watched as the high priest stabbed and drained the blood of the, of the one-year-old spotless lamb, of a, a male lamb. And then the lamb would be tied to a, something similar to the cross, and the high priest would hold it high for all to see and then lower it over the flames, as St. Justin describes. And the flames would burn off all the hair and wool of the, this little lamb. And, uh, and then the flesh would be partly roasted. So it was very bloody, black, and it just was an unpleasant sight. And then the high priest held up that lamb tied on that cross so what do you think was going through the heart of the Virgin Mary already? She was already feeling the, the, the sword piercing her heart. Her whole life she carried this uh, shadow of the nightmare of Calvary. The terrible sacrifice on Calvary for her heart. We say nightmare, I say nightmare, uh, I speak as far as the pain that she went through. But it was a glorious, a glorious event, obviously, because without the redemption, as she knew well, heaven would be still closed and we could never get to heaven. But thanks to our Lord who died on the cross. So St. Anthony of Padua, he says that many shall come from the east and west, that is, those who will come to the Catholic faith, who are not the Jews. And they shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. That is, says St. Anthony of Padua, they will take their rest with the others that are in heaven. But the children of the darkness, excuse me, the children of the kingdom, that is the Jews, the children of the kingdom who are veiled in darkness by refusing the Redeemer, let his blood be on us and on our children, they shouted. The Jews brought on themselves the curse. It's true that at Pentecost and then, and then that week, over 10,000 converted and believed in the Catholic faith and our Lord Jesus Christ as the true Son of God and God himself. But most of the, many of the Jews refused him. And this is what's called the synagogue of Satan. The Jews, the enemies of Jesus Christ who refused Jesus Christ, they forever since will vow till the end of the world when they will finally be converted. But the, the synagogue of Satan will forever till the end of the world fight against Christ and his Catholic Church. And that describes the history of the human race from Christ to the end of the world. It is the battle between the synagogue of Satan and the children of the Catholic Church, of the true Catholic Church that Christ founded. Not the Vatican II version, not the new Ecclesia Dei, let's make an agreement version, with, let's make an agreement with modernism version, not any heretical version, not any false orthodox version, but the Catholic Church as Christ founded, one holy Catholic apostolic, as the Catholic popes of tradition have always taught and defended and condemned heresies. So... The, the children of the kingdom, that is the Jews, will be cast out into exterior darkness. There, says our Lord, shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, um, it is true that every heresy is Jewish in its origin. Because every heresy in some way denies Christ or his teaching. And then the synagogue of Satan uh, is forever vowed to dethrone Christ. And that is why when, as Archbishop Lefebvre described, when Cardinal Bea 
flew to New York City right before Vatican II started in 1961. In 62, in October 11th, it started. That terrible curse on the church. And uh, Cardinal Bea asked the B'nai Barith, which are the Judeo-Masons, which are the synagogue of Satan, who financed the Bolshevik Revolution, the Communist Revolution in 1917. It was financed by the Jews on Wall Street, the B'nai Barith. And Cardinal Bea asked them, what do you want from the church? What do you want from Vatican II? This wonderful event that uh, Pope John the 23rd is going to hold soon. And uh, they all said, give us religious liberty. Give us no longer Catholic states. Give us Jesus Christ, his name removed from the constitutions of Catholic countries. Give us Jesus Christ put on an equal level with Barabbas, with, uh, with Bah Buddha, with Muhammad, with Luther and all the false religion. Give us Jesus Christ uncrowned and we will finish him off. And Carlo Bea flew back to Rome and Archbishop Lefebvre describes in his English sermon that he gave in the 70s in Armada, Michigan, which you should, you can find it on internet and you should re-listen to it. It's a powerful conference. And in that talk he says, he witnessed the light and dark clashing at Vatican II. When Cardinal Bea presented his, his thesis, we must promote religious liberty, the heresy condemned by the Catholic Church for hundreds of years, and Cardinal Ottaviani defending the Catholic doctrine that no, there must be Catholic states, and the state has the duty to recognize Christ as God and King. That is Catholic doctrine. And if any of us Catholics deny that the state should be Catholic, we cease to hold the Catholic faith because that is a teaching of the Roman Catholic Church that the state has the duty to adore, uphold, defend, and with its laws support the Catholic religion. That is Catholic teaching. And that comes from the, not only the divine law, but the natural law. The natural law demands that man acknowledge his creator in his politics, in his laws, in his government, and in his way of economics. And it's only the modern world that has, that has smashed this basic fundamental truth, which even the Romans had a grasp, a certain grasp of. The Romans before Christ did not have the true religion. They were pagans. But they understood when the Romans took over a country, the first thing they did was build a temple to the, to the false gods. But they built the temple. And it was uh, always, uh, man always mingled the, the church and state. Always. But only in modern times we have this heresy <laughs> of separation of church and state. And what is the price of this uncrowning of Christ the King? What is the price of this dethroning of our Lord Jesus Christ in human society as well as in the Catholic Church and then introducing a novice ordo mockery mass, which, which is a dem democratic mass, which is a, a mass that attacks the royalty of our Lord Jesus Christ, the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ, as Archbishop Lefebvre very often says. And that means... Unlike, as Bishop Follet and, and many society priests are starting to say now, the only real difference between the Tridentine Mass and the New Mass is just a matter of beauty. The Old Mass is more beautiful, as one society priest recently was reported to say. And uh, Bishop Follet himself told Cardinal Canisares, had Archbishop Lefebvre saw this Mass in the Abbey of Florence, which was a Novus Ordo Mass facing the altar in Latin, Gregorian chant with incense, traditional vestments, traditional altar cloths, traditional candlesticks, berettas, cassocks. And Bishop Follet said, had, had Archbishop Lefebvre saw this Mass, he would not have had to take the steps that he did. And that is an absolute false statement 
Because Archbishop Lefebvre, when he attacked the new Mass and called it the illegitimate Mass, and he, he explains the new Mass is poisonous not just because of the abuses, but the very Mass itself in the very text, even if it is said in Latin facing the altar, it is poisonous, it is modernist, and is a new expression of a different faith. No longer the Catholic faith is expressed, but the Protestantized, modernist faith. That is why the new Mass is poison. So, what is the price of this compromise with the synagogue of Satan that Vatican, the Vatican did? There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. St. Matthew chapter 8. Weeping, says St. Anthony of Padua. What does the weeping refer to? Weeping because of the heat. The burning fire in hell. The weeping. Because you cannot get out forever. And then he says something interesting here. I've always myself wondered, what does the gnashing of teeth mean? And St. Alphonsus describes it as the remorse of conscience. And St. John Vianney will describe it also as the regret of, of living and dying in mortal sin. But here St. Anthony of Padua says something interesting. He says the gnashing of the teeth because of the freezing cold. And he quotes Saint, from the book of Job, chapter 24, verse 19. They will pass from the snowy waters to excessive heat. Describing hell. Snowy waters and excessive heat. And you know that many saints who saw hell describe they saw parts of hell where it was icy freezing cold where they were gnashing their teeth teeth and would be tossed from unbearable cold to unbearable heat as a distraction to the greatest pain of having lost the vision of the blessed trinity having lost all happiness and joy and all consolation so this gives you an insight into the terrible sufferings of hell, which Christ mentions over 63 times. For in hell there is an unquenchable fire and unbearable cold, says St. Anthony. And the Lord here implies these punishments. So, dear faithful, let us uh, turn to the Virgin Mary. We know we are in these apocalyptic times when the role of the Virgin Mary is, is so incredible. And, and it's in these hours we must grow very close to her and grow, grow close to her immaculate heart. We're in a freezing night of winter with modernism and Vatican II like a cold, deep cold, below zero wind chill, just freezing the faith out of everybody. And uh, the only fireplace where we're going to keep our faith and stay warm in this freezing night of this apostasy, of our age of darkness and apostasy, is the burning heart of Mary, the immaculate heart of Mary. And of course, where she is, the heart of Jesus is. That's the fireplace. Focus. Focus in Latin means the fireplace. And the focus of the old homes used to always be the focus, the central point, was always the fireplace where it was warm. That's where the family would sit, where, where grandma would sew and mother changed the diapers and the kids listened to dad teach to tell stories and catechism or grandpa and where the old men would uh, drink whiskey and talk and the ladies... Uh, do their crochet. It was always around the fireplace and where the kids would play and the family rosary. The focus of the family is the fireplace. And the fireplace of the Catholic Church, of this house of God, is the heart of Jesus and Mary. So this is what happens in the Mass. The very host of the bread and the wine is changed miraculously into the very heart of Jesus. And that's why in the one of the Eucharistic miracles, the, the miracle of Lanciano, the scientists in the 1970s studied the 
the host that changed into the very flesh of Jesus Christ, the King, the eternal high priest. And the scientists found that the heart, it was a cut of the heart, which is surgically almost impossible to do. And it was the cells, the blood cells, which of this miraculous intact host, which is changed into the flesh. The flesh, he, they describe the cells, the blood cells are in a state of trauma. That is a 33-year-old man's body, our Lord, and his heart is in a state of panic. In other words, like a heart attack, a trauma. But it has all the blood and the, and the iron and all the minerals that a, a normal blood and heart has. But it's the cut of a heart of a 33-year-old man which was the age when Christ died. So this is the heart of Jesus you receive in Holy Communion. So ask the Mother of God in the heart of Jesus, strengthen me, Lord, to stay faithful to Thee. And when we look at the four bishops, if I might dare to say, and I speak objectively, I am not anyone to judge. God alone judges. Uh, but when we look at the four bishops of the Society of St. Pius X, Archbishop Lefebvre asked them, stay united in the Catholic faith. Keep the faith. Don't compromise with modernist Rome until Rome comes back to tradition. He said that so many times. And he says in his personal letter to the four bishops, don't do any compromise, no, no buddying up with the modernists until... Until when? Until we have a perfectly Catholic Pope. And this is what the three bishops wrote to Bishop Follet back in 2012. Don't go in this direction because it goes totally against our founder and we will lose the blessings and graces. And the leaders of the society, Bishop Follet and the two assistants, they didn't care. And many of the head priests, they didn't care. And they want this agreement, this canonical recognition with modernist Rome, which is putting second things first and first things second. Because the Archbishop said, our, our interest is not firstly to get canonical recognition. If it means no conversion of Rome and no uh, recovery of the faith in Rome. So the Archbishop had a great vision for the love of the Catholic Church, not just for our own recognition of our own little SSPX, but the whole Catholic Church has to recover the faith. And that is, Rome must come back to tradition. So, Bishop Follet asked, excuse me, Archbishop Lefebvre told this to the four bishops. And Bishop Follet absolutely ignored that. He ignored Archbishop Lefebvre, he ignored the general chapter of 2006, he ignored the three bishops who were consecrated with him. He ignored even his own statements to Campos ten years before, where he told Campos, don't make an agreement, it's going to be your suicide, it's going to be your the loss of your faith, the destruction of tradition in Brazil. And that's what happened. And Bishop Ole ignored them all. But objectively speaking, and I'm saying this so that you'll pray for them, but to speak objectively, none of the four bishops right now are following Archbishop Lefebvre as he laid down. Not one of them. Bishop Follet, Bishop Galaretta, Bishop Tissier are going with compromise. Bishop Tissier and Bishop Galaretta are silent. They're not speaking out against this new direction and the doctrinal declaration and all the modernist statements. They're not speaking about the recent visits now and happening in the last year of Novus Ordo bishops coming to visit the seminary in Flavine just recently. Bishop Snyder, a Novus Ordo bishop, gave some talks to the seminarians in the seminary of the society in Flavigny, France. Winona is going to receive very soon the visit of Bishop Rand Mueller, another Novus Ordo bishop, and it's not in order to bring them to tradition, but it's, it's to establish friendly, cordial relations to show the SSPX is not uh, the, the monster of tradition that it's been advertised to be. They're nice now, they want canonical recognition now, and they want to work together now. 
And what about Bishop Williamson? Well, pray for him. He's a great warrior. He's a great bishop. And he has spoken out against this false agreement. That's why he was expelled. It wasn't because of so-called disobedience and with all the false reasons they're trying to give him. The reason why Bishop Follet Williamson was expelled by Bishop Follet was he opposed the, the modernist agreement with Rome. But even Bishop Williamson, out of his own mouth, says, I don't want to be the leader. I don't want structure. I don't want organization. And he may be right. He may be wrong. God knows. But I think he's wrong on this point. And I, I, and I think I can say he's wrong because Archbishop Lefebvre himself says he's wrong. Because Archbishop Lefebvre himself set up an organization, a structure for priests to keep their priesthood, the faith, and to fight modernism. The Society of St. Pius X. So, objectively speaking, who of the four bishops right now is maintaining the stand of Archbishop Lefebvre? Doctrinally, the three are not. And Bishop Williamson is doctrinally holding the line of Archbishop Lefebvre, but he doesn't want the structure. Unless God gives him, he says, a clear sign. But the clear sign was already given by Archbishop Lefebvre, who was inspired by the Holy Ghost, foretold by the Virgin Mary in, in 1600s to Mother Mariana in Ecuador, that, he would, that Archbishop Lefebvre would be the bishop to preserve the faith and the priesthood. She foretold this hundreds of years before. So it's very clear what our duty is, is just maintain the faith and just do what the Archbishop did. It's so simple. So pray for Bishop Williamson that he, he sees the need for the structure and the organization. And because that's, that's just based on the natural law, let alone the fact that Christ established his Catholic Church as a monarchy, as a hierarchy. And it's true, the shepherd is struck, the sheep are scattered, the Pope has lost the faith, and the, 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 the church is in a massive state of confusion. And many souls are losing their faith because of this. But did that, does that mean we must not have structured organization and good seminaries? No. The Archbishop had a seminaries. And he lived in the seminary and he died next to the seminary. And he's buried at the seminary where he wanted to be, in Acone. So pray for Bishop Williamson, who is a great soul, but he needs prayers to rise to the role that God is asking him to, to just follow the line of Archbishop Lefebvre. And pray for the other three bishops. That Bishop Tissier, he should be a, he should be furious in opposing the destruction of the SSPX. What is happening now? He should be opposing this. And I've written him several letters. Please, Your Excellency, <clears throat> you don't have the right to be silent, because no one else is speaking out against modernist Rome. No other bishops in the world and, the, and up against the modernism of Bishop Follet. Please, at least you, as well as Bishop Williamson, oppose this. But so far, he's agreed to be silent for the sake of unity. And if you hear his sermons and talks, he doesn't attack anymore the way he used to, the modernism of, the po of Pope Benedict and Pope Francis, the modernism and the danger of compromise and the false agreement with Rome. He's silent about it. He'll talk about the old days of the of the our society, the, all, the archbishop and his uh, personal qualities and sanctity. But what souls need to hear now is to defend the faith against the modernism coming from Menzing and now. The acceptance of the new mass as legitimate, the acceptance of Vatican II, 95% of it, which is suicide, the acceptance of religious liberty, a heresy condemned by the church, as expressed in the doctrinal declaration, which is not a prudential document, it is doctrinal, which means we believe these things. And the acceptance of the new code and the new, new uh, oath of fidelity. So this is why the resistance, the Catholic resistance throughout the world, because we're not going to let the Catholic faith be buried. 
We're not going to let our Lord Jesus Christ, as far as we can help it, be uncrowned and spit on by his own. We have to defend the Catholic faith. And if that means opposing now Bishop Fillet and the new superiors, well, that's the way it goes. Pray, I, we pray for them. We wish them well. But we cannot go with them to uncrown and re-crucify Christ, which is what the doctrinal declaration does. And that's what the Catholic resistance is about. That's what we are about. It's about the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ, the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the doctrine of the Catholic Church. That's what it's about. So let's pray to the Mother of God. She is immaculate. She is the defender of the faith. And she is a hater. She hates heresy. She hates all that strips her divine Son of his honor and glory. So stay close to the heart of Mary in this cold winter. And let's go now to the Mass and uh, beg of our Lord, keep me strong in the faith. Keep me in the state of grace. Give me the grace not to compromise. And uh, better to suffer everything than to lose the faith like our ancestors. They suffered cold nights, freezing nights with mass in the middle of the forest. And in Ireland, mass on the rocks, on near the sea, on those, the, the, uh, under the persecutions, under the Protestants. And in Mexico, mass in the volcanic mountains of Colima and in the uh, military camps of the Cristeros in the hot desert sun. But better to suffer all these things and even our life than to compromise the faith. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray, pray for, for us who have recourse to thee. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. <coughs> this is the Feast of St. Timothy. And Timothy worked with St. Paul in the early church. And St. Paul, as you know, he never saw Christ. He heard about him being a Pharisee. And uh, he never saw him. But he converted two years after our Lord ascended into heaven. And Christ appeared to St. Paul, and as you know, in, it's in the, recorded in the book of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, he was, he was literally knocked off his horse, and all the other riders with him stopped, and all the dust of the horses and the neighing, and they were going, what's happening? St. Paul was on his back, and he was surrounded by a bright light, and it was Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ, you know, this is two years after his ascension, Christ appeared to St. Paul. And, say, and he says to St. Paul, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And uh, it's an interesting statement why Christ would say that. Because St. Paul never saw Christ. And Christ is saying, why do you persecute me? And St. Augustine says, and St. Thomas Aquinas says, of course, uh, St. Paul never saw Christ. He is the head of the church. But St. Paul was persecuting the mystical body of Christ, which is the Catholic Church. So he was persecuting the members of Christ's body. So the members are not separated from the head. If the head is separated from the body, you got a monster. So this is what is the Catholic teaching of the mystical body of Christ. Christ is the head, and the church is his body. And we all, by our baptism, by our profession of the holy Catholic faith, we are members of Christ's mystical body. And you can only be a member of Christ's mystical body by professing the Catholic faith. And by, if you don't have the age of reason, by baptism, because baptism gives the supernatural virtue of faith. What are the three theological virtues infused in the soul with baptism that come with sanctifying grace? You know this from the catechism. The faith, whereby we believe all that God has taught because of his authority revealing. The virtue of hope, 
whereby we trust that God will give us eternal life and all the means to attain it. If we really love God and turn to Him and ask His help, He will, always, he will never close the door ever to any soul that turns to Him with a, with a pure and humble heart. A contrite and humble heart, O God, Thou dost not despise. And God loves to hear the prayers of the poor, that is, the poor in spirit, those who know we are poor sinners and we need the help of grace. That's reality. That's reality. And then the virtue of charity is infused into the soul with baptism. And that is the indwelling of the Blessed Trinity in the soul. So there's so much to say about St. Timothy and St. Paul and the mystical body but let me just summarize a, 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 little, a little bit about the most blessed trinity. Because St. Hilary says in the Summa of St. Thomas, on his question on the blessed trinity, he, he, he quotes St. Hilary of Poitiers. He says, Eternity is in the Father. The species, or the beauty, is in the image, that is the Son, and the use is in the gift. So he's calling the Father, Father, he's calling the Son, the image, because Christ, the, the Son, the, is called the image of the Father, the perfect image of the Father, and the use, the usus, the use, or the enjoyment of the use of, is the Holy Ghost. So, uh, these titles, the, the Father is eternity. Why? Because he, he has no beginning. He does not come from another principle. So, the, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, none of them had a beginning in time. And this is so important for us, because what is eternity? Eternity is the measure of the permanent being. The, the being that never had a beginning will never have an end, and that is God. So how a me, eternity is a measurement of God who has no beginning or end, so it's just eternal. It's an eternal now. But what is time? Time is the measure of before and after in a movement. So we are in time because we are fixed in the movement of the movement of the galaxies and the stars and the planets, and we measure time according to that, that God is so, so accurately fixed in the motions of the universe. And his wisdom is reflected in every detail of the movement of the, of the stars and the planets. And even in all of creation, the, the tiniest little insect, the tiniest little flower, the tiniest little jar of honey. Honey doesn't corrupt you don't need a refrigerator for honey. And God made this. It's incredible. All the details of God's creation. So eternity is attributed to the Father. And then species in Latin, which is beauty, beautiful. He is the most beautiful of the sons of men. Christ is. And this is so important to know our Lord Jesus Christ, who really he, he is. He who we love he who we fight for, he we, who we profess, he who so many martyrs died for, little girls your age, like Lucia and, and uh, Madeline and uh, Gabrielle and Maria and uh, all girls your age have faced emperors, have faced being burnt alive, being beheaded, being crucified, being buried alive. Why? Because they professed the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. So why profess his faith? Because who is Jesus Christ? He is one, he is the perfect image of the Father. And he is called species by St. Hilary, meaning most beautiful. That is because he's the perfect image of the Father, who is beauty and goodness itself. And I know this is, this is a bit high maybe, but it's not that difficult to grasp. And for something to be beautiful, St. Thomas and Aristotle say, 
It must have three properties. It must be perfect. It must be proportionate. And it must be uh, have light, clarity. So things that are lacking these three things are not pretty. They're ugly. So when you pick up a, a leaf off the ground, it has perfect proportion, color, and, and uh, it's perfect. The nature of a maple leaf, for example. And so it's beautiful. There's a certain beauty in everything God made because you find all these three things. But in Christ, it is the highest in the second person of the Trinity. His perfection is the one nature with the Father and the Holy Ghost, who is perfect. God is perfect, needing no addition to add to His beauty and goodness and perfection. Secondly, proportion. In the Son is all proportion. And you see that in His wisdom. You know the works of Michelangelo, like this painting on the wall. You know Michelangelo's work because he has a certain style. And he shows certainly a lot of, a lot of flesh in his, in his art. He likes bare bottoms. But uh, you know Michelangelo, the artist, through his artwork, right? And I know, I know among you kids, you have so some of you are talented artists. And you could tell your artwork, and someone can say, yeah, that's so-and-so's artwork, because I know the style of his art. I know how he draws. I know how he paints. So when Christ, everything was made, everything, when we, we say this in the creed, per quam omnia facta sunt, through Christ, the Son, everything was made. And the whole universe, down to the tiniest insect, down to the largest ocean, to the tallest mountain, everything is made with proportion, perfection, and clarity. And when you appreciate an artwork, it has those three qualities, to be beautiful. So, so Christ is perfection himself. He is proportionate because he's the perfect image of the Father. And, uh, and then thirdly, he, Christ, shows in himself the third quality of beauty, which St. Thomas says in Aristotle is light, clarity, claritas, thank you, claritas. So Christ is light inaccessible. He's called that by St. Paul because he is, he is God. So at the transfiguration, Christ showed a little bit of his glory. At his resurrection, it was a stunning bright light that, that threw the soldiers to the ground by fear. And uh, the light that Christ shows in many of his miracles and many of his apparitions down the centuries of his sacred heart, for example, and uh, the light that will shine at his general judgment. So Christ is beauty, beauty himself, the second person of the Trinity. And that's why the scriptures are so full of, especially in the Canticle of Canticles and the Psalms, language glorifying the beauty and the perfection of, 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 of our Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. And then the Holy Ghost. It's a strange term that St. Hilary gives him, calling him usus, which means use are useful. Now, how is the Holy Ghost useful? Here's his words the, about this. Um, he says, yes, here it is, that love that delectation, that felicity or beatitude is called use by him. Because, and he quotes St. Augustine, in the Trinity, the Holy Ghost is the sweetness of the begetter, that's the Father, and the begotten. He's the sweetness of the begotten. He pours out upon us mere creatures 
his immense bounty and wealth. So the Holy Ghost is called use, that is because when you're in the state of grace, God gives you himself, the Blessed Trinity, lives in your soul. For you to enjoy him, that's what he meant by use, to taste the sweetness of the Holy Ghost, to enjoy the presence and friendship of God in the soul. And this is what the whole purpose of the redemption, the purpose of the incarnation, the purpose of the cross and all the sacraments are for, so that God might live in our soul by grace. And he, he cannot wait till we get to heaven to enjoy our friendship and we his, but he can't wait and he anticipates already on earth and even a baby who cannot even say the name of our Lord and doesn't have the use of reason, he is filled with the Holy Trinity already by the power of the precious blood of Christ at baptism. So that the Holy Ghost is given to us to enjoy. It's a, it's a beautiful reality from St. Thomas and the fathers of the church. So how do you enjoy the Holy Ghost? Well, you got to make room for him. And that means we got to open our mind and our soul to all that Christ taught, to the words of the scriptures, and to pray with our heart to God and our mind, to enjoy the presence and the friendship of the Blessed Trinity. And this we do by prayer and contemplation. So, in this Mass, let us ask the Blessed Mother, she is the, she's called the spouse of the Holy Ghost. Let's ask her for the grace to love the Almighty God with all our heart, all our strength, and all our mind. O Mary, conceive without sin. O Mary, conceive without sin. O Mary, conceive without sin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. At that time there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus also was invited to his, with his disciples to the marriage. And the wine failing, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what is that to me and to thee? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the waiters, Whatsoever he shall tell you, do it. Now there were there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three measures apiece. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And Jesus said to them, Draw out now and carry to the chief steward of the feast. And they carried it. And when the chief steward had tasted the water made wine and knew not from whence it was, but the waiters knew who had drawn the water. The chief steward calling the bridegroom and said to them, Every man at first sets forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus do in Cana of Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. So by way of announcement, uh, please pray for our uh, seminarians in Boston, Kentucky. There are about eight that are studying now, and uh, some more are supposed to come because of visas or delay. And uh, we had just got back also, Father Pfeiffer and I, from Asia. We went to uh, see some of the missions in Malaysia, Singapore, and the Philippines. And we had a priest meeting gathering with Father Chazal, Father Suelo. Father Suelo is an old uh, warrior, a Filipino priest, a very good priest. And uh, he sees right through the whole crisis. So he's with Father Chazal. They, uh, they live in a very uh, Spartan house, a priory, a very simple home, um, just the bare necessities. And uh, they have with them 
uh, Brother John, who is one of the seminarians. Father Chazal is building a, a bamboo seminary out in the hills of Cebu. And he hopes there to, to settle. And uh, from there he'll cover the missions in Japan, in uh, Singapore, Malaysia. And he had just started a new mission recently in Taiwan. So uh, pray for Father Shazal. Hopefully he'll be able to come out and visit us in the summer. But the Philippines, as you know, was once a, a great Catholic nation, converted by Spain in the 1500s. And um, the, the child Jesus, the, the Santa Nino, they call him, we saw the, his statue in the Cathedral of Cebu. He's about that tall, decked out in vestments. And uh, in this past, these two weeks, is the big celebration there with thousands and thousands of people who come to uh, venerate the child Jesus. And they have big celebrations with the Filipino dances and the drums and the, and, uh, the carrying of the statue and so forth. So uh, Philippines, as you know, in 1992, up until 1992, it was a solid Catholic country. The constitution of the country uh, did not promote the Masonic ideas of liberty and uh, equality and the pursuit of happiness in the non-Catholic sense, but in the Catholic sense. And it was a Catholic nation. And it said, this nation is a, is a Catholic. Jesus Christ is king of our country. And that was up until 92, when the Vatican, in the name of religious liberty of the Second Vatican Council, uncrowned Christ, and the men of the church betrayed Christ, coming right out of Rome. And the Philippines is one of the last of the countries to be uh, secularized. And there's a whole list of countries that have been secularized since Vatican II, and it's a terrible crime. Pope Pius XI said, that crime of uncrowning Christ and demoting him from the public realm on the political domain will be punished severely in hell. And our Lord will reserve the greatest torments to those who were instrumental in this. So uh, that, says a, that's, that says a lot about the Vatican II Church. The Vatican II Church, which uh, Father Chazal um, he basically calls it the G-A-Y Church, uh, which it really is. We have, you have a Pope of Vatican II promoting it, who says it's not a big deal, who am I to judge? You have a priest in Ireland who recently announced that he was himself a pervert. And just to show you the sickness of this new religion on the people, he received a standing ovation. People in Ireland, to their, their ancestors will be turning in their graves at all these Irish people, giving a standing ovation to a priest declaring himself a pervert. Is he excommunicated? Is he demoted? Is he defrocked? Is he suspended ad divinis? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And uh, there's, it's loaded with cardinals and bishops who are given to these vices. But these vices are still less bad uh, than the apostasy, than the, the, the doctrinal change, the uh, abandoning the true Catholic faith for this Vatican II religion of man. So uh, anyway, pray for Father Chazal's labors as well, and, and uh, the good old Father um, Suelo, uh, it was nice to see a, a good old warrior priest. You know, he, we had caught him in the middle of his missions. He had just flown. He had been on two boat rides, and he was in the airport. He, he had, had, had to spend the night at the airport because his flight was canceled. And, uh, of course, in the airport in Cebu, in the Philippines, there's a chapel there with statues of Our Lady and the Child Jesus right in the airport and St. Teresa and a few other saints. So he was he was there, and uh, but it was Father Suelo who, who said to the priests back in 2012. He 
he said to the priests, and he went, he left with Father Chazelle and Father Pfeiffer um, after they were expelled, and they were not allowed to say Mass uh, on the altar. They asked, can we say Mass at least in the middle of the night in the church in Manila, at the Society Church, and they were refused. And uh, they were refused to say Mass in the Priory, so their only option was to have Mass in the street. And uh, they were also not allowed to, to go to confession to anyone but to Bishop Follet. So it was uh, quite strange. But Father Suelo was the one who said, um, this agreement with Rome, all these steps towards the agreement with Rome, are, is from hell. It's of the devil. And he's the one that said that snakes, they don't chew their victims. There's a certain snake in Asia that doesn't chew on their victims, but he, he makes a salivating slime, that, and he salivates all over his victim, his prey, and slowly, slowly absorbs him and swallows him whole, his prey. And he said, that's what's happening with uh, the Society of St. Pius X now. Bishop Fillet is, is working along with this salivation, this sliming up of the SSPX by the general chapter statement, the six conditions, by the April 15th doctrinal declaration, which is a major compromise of the faith. If you read it, it should shock you because it, it surrenders more than St. Peter's, La Baru, Campos, the Good Shepherd Institute, the Redemptorists. It surrenders more than all they did to get their agreement with Rome. And this surrenders, basically surrenders the faith. And, and you, you're not allowed to do that. And, of course, we all make mistakes, and any of us would be quick to uh, forgive Bishop Follet and let it go. But he has not rejected it. He has not made reparation. He has not condemned that document. And, in fact, he confirms it. He confirmed it with Father Pico, that's why Father Pico joined with Father Chazal, and he confirmed it also with he confirmed it with uh, the June 2013 declaration. So it's it's a tragedy beyond belief. But these are the 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 slimes swallowing the priests of tradition, and the proof is we spoke to the the prior in Manila. The society, the, the new society of Saints, St. Pius X priest. And um, it's shocking. It's shocking to hear the, the slide. Priests that we're talking to, they're starting to defend the doctrinal declaration, bend over backwards to say, well, that's not what Bishop Follet meant to say. But you say, but that's what it says. The new Mass is legitimate. The new code is acceptable. The Vatican II enlightens and deepens the Catholic tradition. That the, the heresy of religious liberty is re reconcilable with the magisterium of the Church. That's what it says. You can all read it yourself. And all the priests have it in their corunum. And every priest should have, reading that, they should have instantly stood up and said, Bishop Follet, you better condemn this or we, or we are with the Catholic resistance because we cannot go along with this modernism. And uh, sadly, those priests who are not opposing it, you know, if you don't oppose and fight modernism, you, it's like a disease, you catch it. And so we're finding, talking to the many priests of the society, uh, Father Chazelle, Pfeiffer, and, and Suelo and I, we spent time with one of the priests, and he was saying, Vatican II, well, you got to look at the good points in it. And, uh, and then he also said that the, the great syllabus of errors of Pius IX, which all of you should reread, he lists all the modernist errors and slams them and condemns them. And it's infallible. It fulfills all the four conditions of infallibility. And on top of that, it's confirmed by St. Pius X in his Modu Proprio Prescientia Scripturae, uh, where he reinforces the syllabus of errors and says, if anyone teaches against these, 
these documents, let them be expelled from the seminary, and let priests not be allowed to teach who hold modernist ideas. And he reinforces Pashendi, and he reinforces all the great encyclicals of the popes uh, concerning modernists with sacred scripture, anyone who will play with the sacred scripture. So this priest told us that Cardinal Ratzinger re said that the syllabus of Pius IX is possibly not infallible. And, <laughs> I mean, who's the authority of, Pius, of Cardinal Ratzinger up against Pius X? Pope Benedict up against Pius X. Pope Benedict is a heretic. Pope Benedict doesn't have the faith. He preaches a new idea of the redemption. For him, limbo doesn't exist. For him, purgatory is just uh, of how you feel before Christ on the day you die. And uh, he has a whole new idea. And But, but uh, anyway, pray for the society priests. You know, they, many good priests. Good old warriors, they are sliding. They are sliding. And uh, they need prayers to wake up. We all do. We all need them, all the priests. So, anyway, back to the Philippines. Uh, one thing that really stood out is the beautiful amount of children. The amount of children everywhere in the Philippines. Yeah, there's just tons of children. Everywhere you go, you see children. And we, Father Kramer had mass in the slums, and out of just out of everywhere, behind the trees and behind the houses, the alleys, came all these little children. And the Filipinos, maybe they're not all out of wedlock, but they certainly have, have the children. And uh, when you come back to the Western nations, you see how, how really the few children there really are it's kind of uh, spooky it's it's like ghost towns and it's people have more dogs now than children and they'll spend tons of money on their pet dog but there's no children and this offends god very very much because marriage of course is for children the first purpose of marriage is children increase and multiply god wants children and he doesn't want uh, spacing and limiting children. Um, we were told in our days in the seminary uh, a coin phrase, which now I see is, is, is really open to ambiguity. The saying, uh, you may space children, but you cannot limit them. Well, that saying is kind of dangerous. It is dangerous because... You may space children, but how long? So it, it's a very dangerous phrase in favor of uh, natural family planning, which is an evil that is tolerated only some, under serious, serious conditions. But normally, in a, in a normal marriage, they, they must take the children God sends, as many, many children as he sends. And... Um, that is the, the great joy and a great cross as well of marriage. So Philippines, they are, of course, since 92, they, their Catholic constitution has been removed. And the Western corruption, of course, is moving in. And um, as uh, the priests in Philippines have said, that uh, the Philippines passed this this uh, law permitting uh, abortion, or the steps towards permitting abortion in the Philippines, which is a horrible thing. And God punished the, that co the country with that huge typhoon couple, a year ago, and earthquakes that brought down Catholic churches that survived 500 years of earthquakes. And now these earthquakes are bringing down the Catholic churches. So God is, as St. Louis de Montfort says, God speaks through the elements. And God is speaking to the Filipino people. Don't go with the modern world. Don't go with the modern ideas. But will they hold out when their bishops and their priests are themselves a scandal? So pray for the great work of 
<coughs> the priests <coughs> in Asia. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. I have a flight to catch, but just very briefly, um, our Lord works the great miracle of making 153 gallons of wine in this miracle of Cana. And it's at the request of the Blessed Mother. And the words to his mother are, Woman, what is it to me and to thee? My hour has not yet come. So what is his hour? The hour, the great hour that Christ speaks of is his hour on the cross, three hours on the cross, his passion, his death. That was the main reason why he came. And so the, the Virgin Mary, she asks, you know, son, they have no wine. She appeals to him to work the miracle. And Christ says to her, basically, my mother, woman, he calls her the noble title of the, the book of Genesis. The woman shall crush the head of the, de of the dragon, of the devil, of the serpent. And uh, all the titles of, in, in the scripture, Genesis and Apocalypse, calling the Virgin Mary the woman. Christ calls her this woman because she is the one. And so he uses that term with her, woman, my hour has not yet come. What is this to me and to thee? Meaning, once you ask me this miracle, this begins the road to Calvary. And the Virgin Mary, she knows it also. And she's, she accepts, she accepts this. And... Uh, that begins the, the clock ticking to the great hour of his passion. And then I want to just uh, give to you from St. Anthony of the Desert, excuse me, St. Anthony of uh, the Hammer of Heretics, St. Anthony of Padua. He speaks about the six water pots of stone. He says the water pots of stone are made of the stone and they hold two or three measures apiece. What, are the, what is the stone? The stone made from the, 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 the stone which the builders rejected. The stone cut from the mountain without ha hands, as Daniel foresaw. How this stone is Christ. He is the, the stone which the builders rejected. And he is the mountain for, uh, foreseen by Daniel. Christ is the stone. And how full are these water pots of stone? They are full to the brim with the water of salvation. Christ, is, he's the one, his sacred heart, who says, Come to me, all you who thirst, and I will give you to drink. And that's the problem with modern man. We're all filled. We're all filled with this world. We're all filled with the dazzling uh, lights and entertainments and endless recreation of this world, of all the things that keep men's minds distracted and if, as the scripture says, if the proud are full, how can Christ fill them? If the glass is filled with muddy water, how can he fill it with clean, good wine? And so we have to empty ourselves of the love of this world, empty ourselves of so many distractions, and focus on the good wine, which is Christ himself. Full to the brim with the water of salvation. Each water pot holds two or three measures apiece. Two for the love of God and of neighbor. And three for the confession of the most blessed trinity. These are necessary in all the water pots. And then St. Anthony of Padua, he says, the, the soul which in the zeal of love passes from vice to virtue, there are six water pots. And he, he names these water pots of a soul that converts from water to wine, that is, converts from sin to virtue, from lukewarmness to love of God. The six water pots are, he says, the first one is contrition. Contrition. I will pour upon you clean water, and you shall be clean, cleansed from all your filthiness. Ezekiel chapter 36. And Jeremiah says, Wash thy heart from wickedness, O Jerusalem, 
that thou mayest be saved. How long shall hurtful thoughts abide in thee? And he also quotes Lamentations. Pour out thy heart like water before the face of the Lord. And he says the, the pouring out of the water is confession. The sacrament of confession. So the first water pot is confession with true contrition for our sins. And as you know, the blood of Christ washes the soul and, and uh, makes the soul brand new like a child after baptism, shining with the light of grace, the blessed trinity in the soul. The second water pot, he says, is prayer. <coughs> the importance of prayer. And prayer purifies the soul. He quotes Jeremiah chapter 31. They shall come with weeping, and I will bring them back in prayers, and I will bring them through the torrents of waters. And that is the purifying waters of prayer. And as Bishop Sheen always used to say, there are as many graces God will give us. He'll give us without prayer because he's so good. But there's many graces and specific graces, especially regarding our salvation and vocations, that he will only give if we pray. That's why it's so important every day to pray. It's not just decoration. It's not just something good Catholics do. We need it to survive. And without prayer, we'll go to hell, says St. Alphonsus. With prayer, you will save your soul. The third water pot is fasting. And, of course, the church gives us times of fasting. And he speaks about the power of fasting. Be converted, says Joel, chapter 2. Be converted to me with all your heart in fasting and in weeping and in mourning. And in St. Matthew, Be thou when thou fastest, anoint thy head, and wash thy face, Christ says. So fasting purifies us. And uh, Lent is coming soon, so we, uh, you, we unite with Mother Church in that great training, the discipline of fasting. More important to fast from sin, but fasting from food helps to uh, restrain the disorder in our soul. The fifth water pot, after contrition, confession, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, and heart, almsgiving is the, is the fifth water pot. And uh, the scripture is full of those who give alms, those who alleviate the needs of your neighbor. And today, it's true in the United States, uh, well, there are actually more and more beggars. You start starting to see them in the streets. And um, when you give to the least, you give to Christ himself. But many souls need are thirsty for truth as well. Some need food and need to be alleviated in that way, and God will bless that. But, uh, but for our fellow Catholics, sometimes we need to give them things to read, websites to look up on, so they can understand the, the fight for the faith that's going on right now and the crisis in the church. Give alms, says St. Luke, our Lord, in chapter 11 of St. Luke. Give alms, and behold, all things are clean unto you. Ecclesiasticus chapter 3, as water quenches a fire, so alms resists sins. Ecclesiasticus chapter 17, the alms of a man is as a purse with him, and shall preserve the grace of a man as the apple of the eye. And St. Anthony also quotes Ecclesiasticus chapter 11, cast thy bread upon the running waters. And the running waters, he says, that's the poor who go from door to door and place to place. For after a long time, thou shalt find it again. That is, in the day of judgment, you will be rewarded for it. So what you give to the least, you give to Christ. And how many examples we see that in the lives of the saints who uh, gave to poor beggars, even lepers, 
and St. Francis, for example, embracing and even kissing a, a leper who stunk and was rotting, and, and uh, how God rewards these things. And so much for uh, so many American people who are deluded by the, by the lies of the media, who live in lies. We swim in lies. And uh, we think everything is just great, and, and here we are on the verge of World War III and uh, believing all the lies, the political lies, all the uh, spiritual lies, and uh, the Vatican II lies, and so many souls are just floating in septic tanks of lies. So the charity we can give to others is firstly by good example. And you who are married and are, will be married, uh, you take all the children God sends. That is a profession of the faith in a world that's killing its children, that loves sterility and death and dying. Uh, committing, are, are the white nations are committing self-extinction. And it's its, its own punishment. Uh, so take the children God sends. That's a profession of the faith. And you'll be mocked for it You'll be ridiculed for it, but who cares? What matters is to please God. And so um, almsgiving comes in many ways. St. Gregory the Great says even a cheerful word. If you don't have anything to give, a cheerful word can be a great almsgiving. So the, the water pots, contrition, confession, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, and the last is the heartfelt forgiveness of injuries received. The heartfelt forgiveness. Um, Ecclesiasticus says, Forgive thy neighbor if he has hurt thee, and then shall thy sins be forgiven thee when thou prayest. Man to man reserveth anger, and doth he seek remedy of God? He has no mercy on a man like himself, and does he entreat for his own sins? He that is but flesh nourishes his anger. And does he ask pardon of God? Who shall obtain pardon for his sins? Remember the fear of God, and be not angry with thy neighbor. Remember the covenant of the Most High. And St. Luke, forgive and you will be forgiven. And Ecclesiasticus 28, And overlook the ignorance of thy neighbor. Refrain from strife, and thou shalt diminish thy sins. So to forgive, for uh, some people can be very hard to forgive injuries and injustices. And in our, uh, in our society, given to sewage, suing everybody for the slightest things, uh, suing is, is sinful. If it's unjust and if it's over-exorbitant, if you demand millions of dollars for just a little damage on your car, that is completely unproportionate. It's disproportionate, and it's a sin to abuse that. So moral theology teaches that if one must sue for just reasons, then they must sue only to pay for the damage is done. And then justice is done. But when we get all these horrible cases of suing for millions of dollars and putting people out of business... That's, that's a, those are sins against justice. And these are this sewage that saturates our Western world, which is a very Jewish thing. Uh, the Jews promote this, and, they, and the, the synagogue of Satan, it, it turns men on each other, like wild animals clawing at each other. A forecast of hell, where they tear each other up in hatred. So forgiving our neighbor... Is, is, a, is what Christ demands of us as children of God. And we have to see God is just. He will punish. He will, he will punish. But we, on our part, we must forgive any injuries we've received. So those are the, the six water pots, according to St. Anthony of Padua. So, the, so let us, dear faithful, turn to the Mother of God, she sees the six water pots, as it were, of the church today, filled with mud, filled with mud, 
and uh, the horrible heresies coming out of Vatican II. Vatican II is loaded with heresies. It's not just uh, a misinterpreted d document. It's not the spirit of Vatican II alone we condemn. And this is now the new language coming out of the superiors of, Saint, of the Society of St. Pius X, that it's the spirit of Vatican II we condemn. No, the Archbishop was very clear. He was there at the Council. He saw these heresies implemented. He saw the, the battles between Cardinal Bea and Cardinal uh, Ottaviani, Catholic doctrine versus Freemasonic doctrine. He saw the takeover of the Catholic Church. And he's, he insisted that the, the Vatican II documents, although not every sentence contains heresy, but the whole thing is infected with heresy as a whole. And you can say that about any document. If you read the works of Martin Luther, a heretic, and the works of John Calvin, these heretics, there's a lot of good in those works. They quote scripture, they believe in Christ, they believe in his miracles. There's a lot of good, but it's poisoned with their heresy. So does so that justify people to say, well, you can read the works of Luther and Calvin? No. And because Vatican II, in its documents, contains the heresies which are still infecting the church right now. We don't just condemn Vatican II of 1965. We have to condemn Vatican II infiltrating the, the Society of St. Pius X and all of Catholic tradition. And you must understand, like Father Suelo's example, that salivating and and sliming of the victim, that is, Catholic tradition, it's going on now. And they have swallowed up 11 traditional communities since 1988. And now they're swallowing the SSPX. And sadly, the SSPX, they're going with it. And they're trying to justify, well, it's not salivation, it's not slime, it's a bubble bath. They mean well. They really mean to work things out and give us canonical recognition and things will work out. We'll finally achieve what Archbishop Lefebvre always desired, which was canonical recognition. That's completely false. Read for yourselves, Archbishop Lefebvre, he, uh, how often he says, the canonical recognition, he says, is secondary. The first thing is that Rome recovers the Catholic faith and we don't compromise the Catholic faith. And if we compromise the faith to get the canon canonical recognition, we, we betray our Lord. We betray the Catholic faith. And he would never say that. Now they're trying to present a new Archbishop Lefebvre who was always loving and gentle and always, always calling that salivation a bubble bath and always wanting this canonical recognition. It's not true. He did not want canonical recognition until Rome came back to the faith. And he wrote that to the four bishops. Do not surrender. Do not compromise. Do not make any agreement. Stay strong and united in the faith. Until when? Until we have a perfectly Catholic Pope. A perfectly Catholic Pope. Is that asking too much? No. And we know we are Catholic. We are not some fringe group. We are not some, some uh, club. We are Roman Catholic. And that means we believe in all that Christ taught. We believe all scripture and tradition. And we know, as Catholics, we are not depressed. We are not sad, even though this crisis is saddening, even though this crisis is hard. And it's sometimes hard to believe that we're living through Vatican II B, but we are. That's why we're here in a hotel and not in your chapel in Edmonds here in Seattle, Washington. Why? Because... Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. Because we believe in Christ's words. The gates of hell will not prevail. We know there will be a good Pope. We know this crisis will end. We know Our Lady will triumph. We have her words. We have Christ's own words. So we carry on. We carry on in the battle. We keep the faith. We try our best to spread the faith, to tell others about how... We must defend the faith when it's being attacked now within tradition. And out of true loyalty to Christ, 
and the superiors of the society by the tenth, we have to tell them we, you're going wrong, you're doing wrong, and you cannot compromise the Holy Catholic faith of all time. And uh, if you accept Vatican II as deepening the understanding of Catholic tradition, you're finished. Once you bite into modernism, you're done. If you accept the new Mass as, as legitimately promulgated, uh, which means taking it as legitimate, you've just betrayed the cause. If you accept the new Code of Canon Law, which is loaded with heresies, as Archbishop Lefebvre, he refused it. It's interesting that right after he died uh, in 91, the next year, they implemented into the seminaries the studying of the new Code of Canon Law. And uh, we were there at the time. And uh, I didn't think too much of it at the time because, all right, we're going to only look, study the new code only in the light of the old code. But the fact is that Archbishop Lefebvre did not want it in his seminaries. And only after his death did they, did they introduce it into the society seminaries. I never realized this until recently. So, anyway, uh, so all you, uh, you youngsters... So, you know, you might be there wondering, well, well, Vatican II, what does that have to do with my life? What do all these cold documents have to do with my future and my future husband and my future uh, wife and my future this and that? Well, it has everything to do because whatever state of life you're in, you, you must stay faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ and the Catholic faith. And that's what brings the greatness of any country is the Catholic faith. The greatness of any family, the greatness of any soul is the Catholic faith that elevates. And you are meant to be pillars of light in this darkness by good marriages that are faithful to each other till death, that have many, 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 many children, a long list of manys, and that you... Uh, if you're meant to be nuns or, or uh, religious in some way, uh, those who will give to the defense of the faith when so many are now compromising. So pray, I beg you, for all the work of the Catholic resistance. It's Catholic resistance, the SSPX Marian Corps. That's all we want is to keep the faith. Pray for Bishop Williamson, who is in his old age, uh, doing his best, and pray for him. He, he, he is all we have for ordinations, and, and uh, he is one of the few loyal bishops that the Archbishop founded, that, that consecrated. So pray for him and pray for all the priests, all the priests, and uh, the priests that you know of the Society of St. Pius X who are in this position of compromise, and they should not be going with it. So do pray for them that somewhere they'll receive the grace to uh, do what they're ordained to do, which is to bark loud and clear. You can read uh, St. Anthony of the Padua. You can read St. Bernard. St. Bernard writes to the bishops of his day, and he's rattling all their cages, and he's shouting at them, and he's saying, you have a duty to, to speak out. You cannot be silent against the heresy of Peter Abelard, which was infecting the clergy at the time. And he was telling the bishops, you cannot remain silent. You must speak out. You are a shepherd, and the shepherd must shout when the wolf is seen. And that's St. Bernard getting on the bishops. So, so therefore, for us priests of the, of the Catholic resistance to get on our fellow priests and uh, to bother our four bishops, we have a duty to do that, that they bark and shout against these compromises of the faith. So let's turn to the Mother of God. Does she compromise? Does she dialogue with the serpent like Eve did and brought our death? No, the Virgin Mary's her only discussion with the serpent, as Father Chazelle loves to say, is the squishing of his head and the spilling out of his blood and brains under her heel. That is the only discussion the Virgin Mary has with the serpent. And we got to keep that tradition. O Mary conceived without sin. 
O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.